Realm presents Echo Park, starring Harry Shum Jr. Episode 3. James, The Circle, August 17th. I stare into the barrel of the gun, held at gunpoint. Again. I'm starting to regret ever setting foot in Doubletown. Turn around, James, and put your hands up against the wall. I choke. James? Okay, it's me, Terry. Cut the bullshit! Turn around, face the wall. Roke says, I consider making a run for the door behind them, but... Their index finger bends around the trigger. No way I can escape a bullet at this range, even if Roque is the world's worst shot. My heart hammering. I turn and do as I'm told. My hands shake. This is the worst possible position. Facing a wall, my back to an armed circle leader. Nowhere to run, my cover blown. If that asshole Waddleford could see me now, he'd have a field day. When did everything turn to shit? Where'd you get the gun? Roque asks. Warm hands roam my shoulder blades and spine. It's Terry's, I strain to say, as Roque's fingers reach the waistband of my boxers. Uh, clones and the originals don't have physical differences if that's what you're checking. I'm seeing if you're bugged, smart ass. Roque grabs my shoulder, flips me around. Roque's brown eyes are still wide, though they now look more annoyed than anything. You're clean. Put your jacket back on and tell me what you did with Terrence. I didn't do anything. I'm trying to find him. Roque narrows their eyes. Bullshit. Look, I'm sorry. I didn't plan to lie to anyone. Terrence missed our last meetup and he hasn't been answering my messages. So I came looking for him. The rest just happened. I just want to find Terry. I'm worried about him. Roque steps closer, their upper lip curled. Worried my ass. From day one, you've been using him. Don't think I don't know about the services he provides, you pig. Of course. My responsible, community-minded clone reported everything to Circle Leadership. Roque raises the gun again. I hold up my palms. Okay, okay. I admit I'm a scumbag for asking him to do that. But he did get paid. And it, it looks like he used that money to help some Echoes out. Maybe we can also help each other. Everyone thought I was Terry today, right? Didn't I calm down, Sarah? Unless the sobbing girl at Iskender's wake was the one who outed me as a fake... And for the billionth time, I'm a civil advisor, not a cop. I'm trained to counsel people out of bad situations, and your community is in pretty bad shape. Your leader, dead, clones going missing, now your therapist too. You could use my help, right? Roque's face betrays no emotion. They keep the gun leveled at my skull, though, so that's not a great sign. I try another angle. Have LAPD followed up on Iskander's murder? Or Mia's? I add, recalling what Sophia, the only other non-clone I've met here, told me. Her echo, Mia, was murdered. Did they interview anyone about the disappearances? You don't ask the questions here, Sauce. Roque snaps. They run a hand down their face. When they look back up, their eyes are red-rimmed. No updates since we reported Mia and his Kenta. Not even after we told them to look into Benny, who's still missing. And now Terrence. I can't help it. I feel the thrill of another chance to play hero. Cops don't care about clones. What if I speak to them on your behalf? I work with detectives all the time. I can ask them to investigate. The likes of Waddleford wouldn't give a shit, but I might be able to convince Kisa. I don't know. I raise my chin. I can counsel clones. Uh, echoes, too. How about I keep playing Terrence to help the community? Just until we find him. Please, let me help. I know that I can. Roque circles me, the gun still raised. Finally, they say, Let's say you can do all that. I'm still keeping you on a tight leash. No counseling echoes until after you get the police to do their jobs. Prove to me that you're truly here to help. Get justice for the dead and find those still missing. Got it? I do. The LAPD station, August 18th. The station, 
once a symbol of power filled with grimy holding cells, is now a nondescript office building that looks as bland on the inside as it does on the outside. I walk through the metal detector and into the big, glossy lobby. Egg-shaped robots on wheels whirred to the traffic reporting area to update their citations. There's not a single cop visible on any of the three floors. Everyone must be out tackling cases. I head to the detective's floor. One workstation is occupied. Waterford. Damn it. His display goggles are lit up with data as he types into the monitor on his stand-up desk. For a second, I consider giving up until someone who might actually listen to me gets back to the station. But then I remember the look on Roque's face. The desperation they very nearly managed to hide. What? You got a minute? Waterford's eyes are bloodshot when he takes off the goggles. I feel a pang of guilt when I realize why he's here. Waddleford got assigned paperwork duty last week after I reported him for rough handling a clone. Hopefully, he doesn't hate me too much. Well, if it isn't Mr. Street Savior. No such luck. Here to report me again? Desk duty not good enough? Not satisfied until I'm suspended, that it? I plaster my best fake smile. I'm not about to start a fight with Waddleford when no one is around. Especially not when I need a... Well, does it count as a favor if I'm just asking the man to do his job? I'm here about a case. Actually, several cases. As quickly as possible, I summarize what I've pulled from the system on my way here about Mia and Iskender's murders. Not much. On top of that, there have been a couple of disappearances, too. I say, building up to mentioning Terrence. But Waddleford crosses his arms and glances away. Yeah, I know about Iskender. The rest doesn't really ring a bell, and I'd prefer not to deal with clone crimes right now. I don't want to offend any more clone lovers. Waterford puts his goggles back on and returns to the monitor. I open my mouth to respond, but a pair of young police officers walk in. The sight of them makes me curl up inside. Hey, watchdog, wanna go for a walk? One officer hollers at me, all the other woofs. This is a bad idea. I should leave. Maybe Terrence will turn up on his own. Maybe he even knows where the other missing clones are, too. Maybe they're all safe. I can just tell Roque some lie about the police taking their sweet time to look into the murders. Bureaucratic tape, all that jazz. It's certainly believable. Communication is already crap between the clones and LAPD. Roque would never know. Then I picture Terrence gagged and bound in a basement somewhere. I curse. I can't give up on him. Not yet. Uyung arrives at the station around noon. He takes a big bite of a banh mi sandwich and waves when he spots me sitting in front of the steps. Jimmy, you on the job again today? I shake my head. No, let's talk in private. We walk to Uyung's workstation. Luckily, Waterford and the other cops have already emptied out for lunch. Wu Young pushes a swivel chair my way and slumps down in his own. What's up? It's about a murder. Two of them, actually. And at least a couple missing persons who might be tied into the cases. Wu Young's eyebrows climb his forehead. What murders? Iskender Aquarius and Mia Capricorn. Wu Young's face folds up. Not as blatant as Waddleford's reaction, but clearly evasive. He leans across the desk, spraying Bon Mi chunks as he chews with his mouth open. Look, Jimmy, how do I say this? Um, there are murders, and then there are clone murders. We got our hands full. The hell does that mean? I demand. You know, the state of funding these days. We're running around like chickens with our heads cut off just trying to take care of priority cases. So what, clones getting murdered aren't a priority? Wu Young takes a vape pen and sticks it between his lips. Violence done to clones, possibly even by clones, is pointless to try to unravel. It's hardly enough trying to understand that community's weird-ass culture. How's any normal person supposed to figure out their motives or unravel the conflicts that are always having? <laughs> Wouldn't wish that upon anyone. But you know about Iskender? Of course I do. There's infighting in the clone church. Some want integration with originals, others want to stay in their clone bubble. 
He probably got whacked because some anti-integration opponent disagreed with him. It's out of our hands. And Mia? She wasn't even a member of the Circle. Anti-clone graffiti was found on the wall by her body. What excuse are you going to use for her? Wu Young swerves back to me, his dark features tightening. Excuse? I hope you don't think we're not doing our part, Watchdog. We looked into it a bit after it happened. No witnesses came forward for the murders. No one would talk to us when we knocked around. Some even threw rocks to get us to leave. What are we supposed to do? Drag clones out of their homes to interrogate them? Oh, because that worked out so well for what? I ignore the cold glint in Wu Young's eyes. What if this was a clone hate group? No solid lead so far. Wu Young exhales bubblegum scented smoke. Look for Benny Gemini. His name came up at the clone church. He disappeared around the time of Mia's murder. He might know something. Sure, we'll check on him. Wu Young says, but he doesn't turn on his monitor to search. He cracks a smile I don't like. You sure you're not getting too caught up in this clone business? My stomach clenches. I hesitate. Not sure if I should bring it up. I've tried to keep my work life and private life separate, especially since I don't need my colleagues wondering why I keep in such close contact with my clone. But they'll need to know eventually. Terence is missing too. I'm worried he might have been kidnapped or something worse. Wu Young frowns. Huh? You still in touch with him? <laughs> 24 hours is hardly a missing person, but I'll let you in on a secret. Folks are starting to talk about you, Zhang, saying you're getting too involved. It's one thing to counsel clones, another to embarrass a detective to score points with them. <sighs> I look away. It was my job to report Waddleford. Besides, the alternative would have weighed more on my conscience. And God damn it, I'm trying to help. Why can't the police see that? Hell, oh, why can't the Circle see it either? Why does everyone stare daggers at me these days? Hey, don't look so down. Just let us do what we do. And maybe there's a bright side to all of this. More clone violence equals more reason to argue we need an uptick in funding. <sighs> more funding doesn't equal more peace. Have you forgotten why the LAPD got deflux in the first place? Wu Young shrugs. Sure haven't. You want eyes on the clone community though, don't you? The higher-ups are ordering more drones and officers into Echo Park. More surveillance will make clones think twice about committing crimes. Sounds more like intimidation. You come into Echo Park already assuming that locals will commit crimes. How does that help them? Wu Young pats my back harder than necessary. Frankly, that's none of your concern. Stick to your job description, James. With all due respect, Detective Wu Young, that is my job description. I walk away. I guess I'll have to do this myself. The Circle, August 18th. The rundown community center looks different after my chat with Wu Young. It no longer seems like just a place for clones to hang out, but rather a sanctuary. It's the one place they can turn to for help, since they won't find it anywhere else. I glance around before I push through the Circle's main doors. No police vehicles or drones patrolling Echo Park. Yet. A few clones wave at me in the hall. Terrence, good to see you, man. Guess Roque hasn't spilled the beans on my identity yet. I wonder if that means they're starting to trust me. Doubtful. I wave back weakly and try to smile. At the same time, I trace the chunky rainbow in my jacket pocket. Glad to have something to rinse my mind of what's surely a bad memory in the making. I find Roque folding chairs in the auditorium. Late afternoon sunlight filters in through the dusty windows. They wear a gray two-piece suit and their hair is swooped neatly to the side as usual, but there are shadows under their eyes. They yawn as I step inside. You miss a service. Lots of Terrence's regulars showed up. Everyone wanted answers. Got any? I rehearsed what to say on the way here. Excuses, apologies. Nothing feels right. It's one thing to debate policing procedures with Wu Young, another to discuss them with someone whose life depends on the outcome. The police will look for Benny. As for Terrence, they said he hasn't been missing long enough to warrant a search. Roque's face clouds. What about Iskenda? Mia? I wish I'd taken the chunky rainbow before this conversation. No leads yet. It's a matter of priority. 
There are some other cases that... Priority? What can be more urgent than dead bodies? Non-clone dead bodies, I think. I fold up the nearest chair, forcing myself to meet Roque's eyes. Actually, it's worse than that. One of the detectives told me they're planning to increase surveillance in Echo Park. More drones, more officer presence. Let me guess. They're not coming to track down Iskender's killer. Police brass wants the city council to increase their funding. They'll need to show increased arrests and citations. Easiest way to do that is not by solving difficult crimes. Roque stuffs their hands into their pockets. They'll provoke us, plant shit, make false arrests. I hope I'm wrong, but yeah, they've done it before. I brace myself for more chair slamming, but Roque just hangs their head. As they do, I catch a glimpse of Terrence's 3D printed gun in a holster under the flap of Roque's suit jacket. Good. This will help us prepare. Prepare? I ask. Roque's eyes glaze over. Suddenly, I see why they're a leader at the circle. They're always planning, trying to be one step ahead. They have a certain brutality that might be useful. If the dent in the wall is any indication. Roque glances at the podium where Iskender's portrait hangs, glowing faintly in the sun. Iskender always believed echoes and sources could coexist. Look where it got him. Drowned in Echo Park Lake. His Kenda and Mia were killed by a clone hate group, and the cops were too lazy to do anything about it. Now they want to come in our turf and investigate us? The circle protects our people. If your pig buddies try anything, we'll be ready. I shiver at their promise, but I'm starting to see how they might be right. What other options do they have? Anti-clone sentiments have been building since clones moved into Doubletown. It wouldn't take much to tip all that pent-up anger into violence. Like tossing a match into dry grass in the middle of August. I'm about to ask how Roki plants to prepare when they throw something at me. A pair of silver keys. The big ones for the main entrance, and the small ones for Terrence's office. I raise my eyebrows. I'm pretty sure I failed to do exactly what you asked me to do on every level. I expect you to play his role to a T. Got it? Only comfort people and don't mingle. Don't talk to them about the murders, no matter how hard they press and report anything new to me. Why do you even trust me? That's my business. If I so much as catch a whiff that people suspect you're not really Terrence... You'll hang my bowels over Iskander's portrait as an example to other sources who try to infiltrate the circle. <laughs> yeah, got it. I fake salute. Yo, quick study. They unholster the gun and hold it out to me. Grip first. Take it. You need to play him to a T, right? Right. The Circle, August 19th. I start counseling the next day. The minute my work shift finishes in the afternoon, I come straight to the Circle. Although, not before a quick pit stop to take a small hit of Chunky Rainbow. I just need to calm my nerves. That's all. This will be the biggest test of my impersonation skills yet. Terrence doesn't have a computer. How does the guy survive? Instead... He uses a sheet of paper taped outside his door where people can sign up for appointments in one-hour increments. There's already a line of people in the hall when I arrive. I recognize Scarecrow Thin Enzo, leaning against the wall in that too big blue suit. I was counting on my high to get me through, but no amount of narcotics could have braced me for the stories I was about to hear. I, I, I keep a knife under my pillow and added another deadbolt to keep intruders out, says the thin woman with a nervous tick whose apartment was broken into a few weeks ago. Her eyes dart left and right in the cramped office despite its tall, protective bookshelves and locked door. Thanks for telling me about the family rooster place. They let me hide out a while. I, I need to learn how to feel safe in my own home again. Others are more worried about daytime problems. Two convenience store clerks refused to serve me after I showed ID, says Enzo. His bony fingers poke out of baggy sleeves and trace his metal circle pin. His, I note, has a bar down the middle. Pro integration. 
They said they don't serve booze to Zodiacs. <laughs> First time I heard that used as a slur. Iskander said we should be patient, but maybe Roque's way is better. Maybe the outside world will never accept us. And then there are the concerns directly tied to the murders. Clones who are afraid of even leaving their homes at night were worried about brewing conflicts dividing the circle. Not knowing who is behind the killings, some clones suspect everyone, including each other. I try my best to soothe where I can, offer suggestions if needed. Mostly, I'm just a listening ear, absorbing their pain, trying to share it. The longer the day wears on, the more my brain feels like it's melting. Not from the chunky rainbow this time. Are the murders the result of clone hate group? It seems the most likely scenario, but what about Wu Young's theory? Infighting in the circle? Some clones make it sound like it could be possible. I think of how wide-eyed and excited Terence was the first time we met, like how it was a miracle he'd wish for. Terry wanted to meet me. Terry wanted to meet his original. Did that mean he was pro-integration, like his kinder? Had he been murdered because of his stance? My chest already feels heavy enough. Adding that idea on top of it all, I sink into my chair as my second to last client departs. The next one on the sign-up sheet doesn't come for half an hour, thankfully. I need a break. My hand twitches toward my jacket, with a tiny packet of rainbows tucked into its concealed inner pocket. Maybe just another half. Almost done, Roque. I say. I'm not Roque. Sarah. She has more color in her cheeks than the last time I saw her, sprinting out of the community center in tears. She still sports the same homemade metal circle on her t-shirt, without a bar. She lingers by the doorway. I won't make the first move. I'm still not sure if she's the one who told Roque I wasn't Terrence, or if they figured it out on their own. I won't be long. Just wanted to thank you for counseling me about Iskander yesterday. Gave me a lot to think about. No problem. So, she still thinks I'm Terrence. The late afternoon sun burns through Terrence's slim office window. After a few seconds of awkward staring, Sarah says, did you find out where Charles went? Charles? Where have I heard that name? That's right. Sophia Newhouse. Before the vigil yesterday, she asked if I'd seen Charles. Why do you ask? Didn't you say you would check up on him? Check up? Did you hit your head today, Ter? Look. She taps her phone and scrolls to an InstaTalk account. The profile picture shows a man with red curly hair and dark eyes that peer teasingly over wire frame glasses. He poses in stylish outfits in various venues, restaurants, showrooms, Dodger Stadium. Of course I recognize him. Charles Sagittarius, the most famous clone in LA, possibly the world. I grew up seeing five-year-old Charles in commercials for Arcogen's cloning program. He hasn't posted anything since August 11th. Sarah scrolls to a photo of Charles hugging Iskander behind a podium. The post was a tribute post to the former circle leader whose drowned body was found that same day. He hasn't been replying to my DMs either. I thought his silence was just grief. But didn't you say he called you a few days ago? He needed your help? My high is wearing off fast. It's getting harder to keep that cheerful, don't worry, let me handle it. Terrence smile on my face. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm sorry. I haven't been myself. Everything that's happened, I'm a bit scrambled right now. Can I follow up with you later? Sarah screws up her face like she's about to argue. Please? I say, her expression softens. Of course, Ter. As soon as she's gone, I leap up and search the session record books that line the bookshelves. Sarah just gave me a new lead. Terrence. Oh, bless him organizes his books alphabetically. It doesn't take long to find the most recent entry on Charles Sagittarius. Charlie called me from Hillside Central Hospital. He was attacked. I go cold as I read. Apparently, Charles was being antagonized by an anonymous, anti-integration radical on Incitoc. This radical Anon tried to make Charles broadcast a manifesto suggesting clones kill their originals and take over their lives. When Charles refused, Anon threatened to kill him, and then deleted their account before Charles could report them. The next day, someone doused Charles with a bucket full of corrosive acid. 
It was broad daylight in downtown LA, where he'd just finished photo shoot. The assailant fled before Charles or anyone at the scene got a good look at their face. I curse. Kill originals and take over their lives? Really? There have been conspiracy theories like that ever since Arcogen launched their first marketing campaign. I've even been on ride-alongs to investigate such claims, mostly from affluent young people with clones. But all of them prove baseless. Just anti-clone paranoia. No real threats. Now there was some wacko out there actually pushing for it. An anti-integration radical? A clone? I skimmed to the final note in the diary. Charles's attacker will want to finish the job. I have to hide him. August 12th is a date. This is Terry's last entry. Maybe the last thing he did before he vanished. Is this why Terence disappeared? To protect Charles? I can't tell Roque Charles was attacked by an anti-integration radical. Sure, I like Roque. I want to trust them. But after seeing their circle symbol, Sans Bar, and listening to them talk about preparing, what if they have something to do with this? I don't know if I can trust them. Not yet. I need to talk to an original. Sophia. I find Sophia's contact information on an online freelance writer's directory and call her. Hello? Hi, Sophia. How's it going? I attempt Terrence's usual cheer. A pause. Do I know you? Why are you calling me? James Zung? My breath hitches. Damn it. I forgot I was using my own phone. Caller ID strikes again. Yes. Hi. Think fast. I'm calling because my clone Terrence Libra is missing. Did uh, anyone tell you where he went after you interviewed him for your article? Another pause. I'm afraid I don't know. Anything else? She sounds colder now, compared to when we met in person. Too late, it hits me. I groan. Sorry, I... I must be bringing up painful memories about Mia. But I have no one else to ask. What's really going on here, James? I just told you. Terrence is... Terrence isn't missing. I spoke to him yesterday. I take a deep breath, glancing around the office. This is a risk. But then, so is everything at the moment. I'm not sure I can trust Roque. I'm not sure I can trust Sophia either. But the way she spoke about Mia yesterday... I decide to follow my instincts. Standing, I double-check the lock on the door. Then, I lower my voice before I answer. Actually, no. You didn't. Quietly, I confess everything. How I first learned Terrence was missing, and finally how we met yesterday while I pretended to be him at the vigil. Shit! Sophia says. I brace myself, but then she softens. I understand. I'd do the same for Mia. The other clones don't know that I'm not Terrence. Hell, only one even knows he's missing. You can't tell anyone. I won't. But I can't help you, James. I think Terrence is hiding Charles. You were looking for Charles, too, right? I repeat what I read in the August 12th session entry, along with my theory. Maybe Terrence took him into hiding. It would explain why Terrence wanted a gun. Any idea who the assailant might be? Sophia asked. Roque flashes before my eyes. No. Unlike the LAPD, I'm not going to accuse a clone of violence without evidence. Instead, I say, No leads yet. But I'll be here in Terrence's office until I solve this, if you want to join me. There's a long pause before she tells me. No, I can't. But good luck. I have faith in you. At least one person does. I brace myself for more endless depressing work. Outside the window, the sun sinks. Another day gone. They say the longer anyone remains missing after 48 hours, the worse their chances of ever coming home. Sunset tonight marks the start of that clock for Terrence. What happens if I can't find him? Will he become another number in the police database? Will I even still have access to that database after my next random drug test? <sighs> I need a break.
I head to a nearby convenience store and grab a ham and cheese sandwich for dinner. I'm aware of the clerk's disdainful glare as I scan my phone to pay. I wonder if this is the same clerk that refused to serve Enzo. Counseling clones is teaching me more than I ever wanted to know about hardships in Doubletown. I eat the sandwich back at Terrence's desk. Staring at his bookshelves, I mutter, Terry, where are you hiding? It comes to me in a flash. The family rooster. The woman whose apartment was broken into said Terrence hit her there. Could he be hiding Charles there too? Worth a shot. I tuck the session record book under my arm, grab the gun, and run out. The family rooster's faded red storefront glares under the streetlights. It's an abandoned Chinese restaurant at Sunset Boulevard and White Knoll Drive in a once bustling shopping plaza. Foot traffic here has all but vanished since the clones arrived. The front doors are locked, so I circle around to the back, where I find an empty parking lot. It's dark enough to take risks. Quickly, I check to make sure nobody's across the street. Clear. I take a step back, raise a leg, and kick hard. <coughs> it smells <coughs> lonely, like dust and stale blankets. I step into a narrow, dark hallway. The light switch doesn't work, so I prop the door open before I move inside. Cobwebs stretch over the corners of the low ceiling. Hmm, I could be wrong. Maybe I just kicked open the door and broke in for nothing. Then I see the light under a closed door up front. This must be the kitchen. There's someone there. Hey, I'm coming in. Adrenaline prompts me to raise the gun. Two candles on either end of a long butcher's table light the kitchen. They illuminate the industrial refrigerator and the tin cans in the sink, which smell fruity. Canned pineapples? Show yourself! I see a hand wrapped in gauze slide across the fridge door. A man steps out, clutching the fridge. He's completely bandaged, from his head all the way down to what I can see of his ankles under the rolled up cuffs of his jeans. A few curls, red in the candlelight, coil under the bandages around his forehead. Relief floods me. Charles? I knew it. You're working with them. I knew it. He darts out of the kitchen before I can make sense of it. Stop. Charles. I chase him. Charles half runs, half drags himself down the hallway. Relatedly, I tuck the gun away. Maybe I scared the poor guy and push my legs faster. I'm less than a foot away from him, almost to the back door. I reach for his arm, then hesitate. There's not a single unbandaged spot on his body. What if I hurt him more, grabbing him? My hesitation gives Charles all the time he needs. He flings the back door wide and rushes into the night air. Door slams in my face, sending me sprawling on my ass in a dingy hallway. By the time I crawl back to my feet and wrench a door open, Charles is gone. Shit. Shit! Shit! I jog toward the front of the restaurant. Charles? I call, as loud as I dare. I don't want to wake up the whole neighborhood. Especially not when Charles has a good reason to keep a low profile. <laughs> my nose stings. I touch it, surprised to find some tears swelling in my eyes. The door must have hit me. I barely felt it. Probe my nose gingerly. Is it broken? No time to check. Charles can't have gone far. I can still catch up. Someone grabs my shoulder. I whirl, expecting Charles, and instead, stare straight into my own eyes. Terrence, his hair matted and face covered with days old stubble, drops the plastic bag of canned food he's carrying. He stares at me with wide, haunted eyes. You're listening to Echo Park, starring Harry Shum Jr. Echo Park is a Realm production. Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Echo Park stars Harry Shum Jr. Written by Curtis C. Chen, Monty Lin, Millie Ho, Sloane Leong, and Jen Reese. Produced by Rhoda Belleza, Fred Greenhalge, Kaylin West, 
and Haley Wagreich. Directed by Pun Bandu. Executive produced by Molly Barton, Marcy Wiseman, Julian Yap, and Harry Shum Jr. Associate produced by Michael Coulter. Starring Harry Shum Jr. and Nikki Tauzon. Loop Group actors David Chen, James Taku Leung, Constance Parng, and Artemis Snow. Sound design by Krista Giametti. Mixing and mastering by Rory O'Shea. Audio editing by Justin DeWald. Original score by Martin D. Fowler. Music supervision by Marcus Begala. Production manager, Alexis Latshaw. Production coordinator, Angela Yi. Casting by Sunday Bowling and Meg Mormon. Cover art by Kendall Thomas and Louise Daisy. Executive in charge for Realm, Mary Asadolahi. Find more shows like Echo Park by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm. <laughs>